It's really a pleasure to be the person to see you just before you go to lunch and just after you come back from lunch. And I got to tell you, you look exactly the same. Uh, anyways, uh, um, like I said earlier, before lunch break, uh, I have the honor and the privilege to be your host the second part of the day. Stepping into many's uh, shoes is never, ever, ever fun, but I'll do my best. So without further ado, we're continuing with our track today um, with another group of amazing speakers. The next topic that we're going to cover is actually a topic that was mentioned here throughout the morning over and over again, and I think I want to share with you something. You know, I've been doing cybersecurity now for almost 20 years, from the age of four. And um, it's, it's really fascinating to see how the discussion has matured, not just from the technological perspective, but also from the business perspective. And we're standing here at a cybersecurity conference, and myself included, I, I thought I was going to be innovative, you know, talking about it, but apparently everyone is talking about cyber strategy. So yes, we're still talking about the technologies, we're still talking about you know, the different tools that we're gonna to use to implement cybersecurity, but I think that the key topic that we're talking about throughout this day is about strategy. And the fact that we as an industry have matured to understand that it's not just about the technology, it's not just about the skill of the people, it's not just about the processes and the ecosystem, it's about everything combined into a holistic strategy. And with that thought in mind, I want to welcome the moderator of our next session, the Cyber Roadmap. I would like to invite the chair uh, to the stage, a very close and good friend of mine, Dr. Yanni Varel, the head of the research strategy here at the Blavatnik ICRC Tel Aviv University, and the general manager of the Cybersecurity Solutions Group at Dell EMC. Yanni, please join me on stage. Great Matan, thank you very much and it's a pleasant to be here uh, with you this uh, afternoon and we are going to talk about the cyber roadmap. The cyber roadmap, which I'll take this uh, clicker to help us to see the next uh, slide, so the, the, cy the cyber roadmap, we would like to talk about the role of the large technology companies. We, are, we, we spend this morning talking about the role of governments. We are going to talk a, a lot about the role and the community of startups that we have here in our country and the generally in the, in the industry. And now we, are want to, we want to dedicate this session to talk about the role of the, the companies. And we say that in this uh, era, in this uh, uh, very important uh, moment, we believe that there is a very, a very important role to the large companies to lead and to, to find a way how to take our industry uh, forward and how to take the, the challenges and to bridge the important gaps that we have uh, today in our cyber uh, uh, industry and in our uh, society. We want to mention and we want to, uh, to say that we still expect the large companies to lead us and to, to find a way to jump the, the big leaps and to find the, the, technic, uh, the techniques and the mechanisms and to, to bring the energy in order to lead and to make the, the great efforts. And when we talk about the great uh, efforts, so we mean, of course, technological, we mean conceptual, we mean business, and we mean uh, many others. Part of them may be also to create ecosystems, like we have here in, uh, in Israel, in Be'er Sheva, or in other uh, locations, but these are part of the things that we expect also large companies to be, to be involved in in this, uh, in this era. And we are going to talk here in this uh, session about roadmaps and about what are the large companies at that moment look forward and uh, share with us about their uh, roadmaps. And you know, when we talk about roadmaps, we believe that the companies can bring the efforts and the roadmap in various aspects. It can be the aspects of the the R&D, the platforms, 
the uh, R and D and the, uh, to bring their experience, to bring their expertise, to find the the efforts and the other uh, ways that they are going to bridge these uh, gaps that we see here. So, with no any other uh, beginnings and uh, uh, many uh, any other discussion, we'll start with our uh, session. And uh, as a chairman of this uh, session, I will not share with you this afternoon the roadmap of uh, Dell EMC, but we will hear a very interesting uh, uh, talks of my three uh, colleagues from Microsoft, from uh, Intel, and from IBM uh, uh, Security uh, to hear their views and their uh, roadmaps. So I would like to invite our first uh, speaker here this afternoon, Mr. Baracha, Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Azure. Please. Thank you, Dr. Harrell, and uh, good afternoon, Tel Aviv. Uh, I am honored and excited to be here in front of uh, some of the sharpest minds and uh, smartest entrepreneurs in cybersecurity. Uh, with uh, the introduction from Dr. Harrell, I'd like to share some of the breakthroughs uh, that are being uh, uh, tried out uh, and some of our thoughts on how things change uh, going forward. Not a single day uh, goes by without you hearing about somebody getting into some networks, stealing data, ransomware attacking your data, uh, etc. It does appear like the deck is pretty heavily loaded against the defenders. Uh, and let's see why. Typical, uh, typically, what we see happening is that uh, there is a lot of energy and a lot of effort being put into protecting the perimeter, looking at perimeter defense, even analytics at the perimeter level. Uh, this, of course, assumes everybody is patching and keeping everything up to date and using multi-factor. And if you do all that and then, then you protect your perimeter, uh, what you see typically happening is that the attackers, especially these days with automation, keep trying to find a chink, and the defenders work hard, relentlessly trying to protect against these kind of attacks. As far as, uh, whenever there is scale and humans involved, sooner or later, something's going to go wrong, and it takes one little mistake or one little gap somewhere left unprotected for the attackers to get in. So this is one of the most common problems and uh, that attackers get in. So now, let's think about what needs to happen to rethink how we've been doing things. And I know a lot of you are already on their journey, but let's look at what needs to be done to kind of rethink what is going, in, go, what is going on. First and foremost, as you see with this kind of a model, where one little mistake, one little gap lets the bad guy in, we well, gotta realize that bad guys are probably already in. Maybe there are multiple of them. Even if you do detect something like this, you're gonna have a tough time figuring out what have they done, how many tow holes have they created, where are they lurking. You can try evicting them, but if you don't know what all, where all they have been le leaving back doors, it'll be tough to evict them. Worse, even if you do manage to evict them, you've got to know how they got in, run the forensics to be able to figure out what was your mistake, where was the gap, to really go make things better. So this is a really tough problem that we really need to see how we're gonna solve that. So we gotta change the way we're doing this and the way we have been thinking about and actually acting on is that we've actually expanded our uh, perimeter defense further and we have lots and lots of sensors that we use inside the network in addition to all the perimeter sensors. Uh, I would assert that every resource you have that you're trying to protect is actually a pretty good sensor, 
as long as you can collect the logs and telemetry from those sensors. Uh, but we, we use more sensors. We are a big fan of identity-based sensors. Everything that we can do with identity, every attack masquerades as an application or an end user or a machine. The more identity-based sensors that you can leverage, better it is. We use endpoints, identities, our resources, uh, and we also kind of have found good, a good kind of correlation to looking at crashes that we see that relate back to attacks. So the first thing, lots of sensors, lots of data that you need to actually collect. And the more sensors you have, the wider the aperture, the faster you will detect. Further, collecting lots and lots of data and actually keeping them for a while will then allow you to then go back and do better forensics and, and, and understand where the attackers came in from, what, all, what, what else they've done. So that's the first thing. Lots of sensors, leverage your resources, collect data, go look at the data and kind of have a very broad aperture by which you are looking at it. But that's not, that's not the only thing. Oh, actually, here's the animation that says, shows that as the attackers move along, somewhere along the way, a sensor will fire, or maybe more than one sensor will fire. Previously, the defender makes a mistake, attacker gets in. Now, the attacker has to trigger one of the sensors that we have for them to be detected. And um, the other thing about the sensors is, we really don't think that you can look at all the telemetry and the logs that you're collecting in silos and in isolation. Being able to connect the, the telemetry and the logs from your sensors and, and, and have a broader context of what is going on actually is the, the power you have. We call it the, secure, the intelligence security graph. And you know, there is for, for about, for quite a few years now, people write that attackers use, operate with graphs, defenders use lists. We think the defenders need to actually look at the graph as well. So if you really look at all the data you're collecting and all the alerts from the sensors and actually have a context around it, you will be in a better position to actually not just detect faster with the wide aperture of, uh, of sensors, but also have forensics to, to evict and clean up. So that kind of summarizes kind of the first step of how we're thinking about this problem and what we're doing. Um, next, almost every a customer I meet, every organization is going through a digital transformation and cloud is one of the best ways for, you, for the organizations to accelerate their digital transformation. Every customer who does a pretty good job with their on-premise uh, uh, resources are concerned. Well, what about the cloud? How is the, how, what happens to all the resources? Do I lose the visibility? Well, I'd like to assert that most cloud vendors and, and I speak for uh, Office 365 and Azure, actually do a very good job of looking at wide range of sensors and collecting lots of data, and they do it at almost no cost to you. We are already doing it all the time. So your resources in clouds are just an extension of how most well-managed organizations are running their infrastructure today. And this happens at almost no cost. The other thing I want to talk about is what I will call as the cloud effects. For us, uh, we are, you know, your resources may just be one tenant, but we have millions and millions of other tenants. And any unique attack on one tenant actually is not as unique when you look across millions and millions of tenants in the cloud. So we have what I'll call as the cloud effects to further amplify our ability to detect and, and do forensics, and even go as far as attribution of where the attacks are coming from. So, uh, and I talked about the intelligence at the scale at which we operate. For us, this is a very unique value. You know, we look at, you know, 30 billion plus authentications, billions of Windows machines and endpoints, millions of servers, billions of emails which we actually detonate and clean up and can detect attacks. And anything that we, any, uh, uh, um, any detonation or any malware in email, within minutes we get to apply it 
to all the mailbox in the cloud. Ditto with any attack on any VM. Within minutes, we apply to all the VMs. So this is very unique power that we actually bring to bear through the cloud uh, for, for all the uh, assets in the cloud. Um, so, so we kind of talked about the two big things, your assets in any cloud, and certainly 365 and Azure, are just an extension of how you would do things. We do a lot of things on your behalf, almost no extra cost for you, and the cloud effects really, really helps in kind of driving huge amount of uh, uh, value in terms of ability to detect and protect in, in ways you cannot, you, only a big cloud vendor can bring to bear uh, at, at the scale at which we operate. Uh, to kind of go back and recap then, the more you look at, the, the wider the aperture, the more uh, sensors you have, and the more you look at your resources, the better your ability to detect what is going on. So starting with your perimeter, inside your networks, next click stop, outside your network, and across the cloud. If you're going to collect all this data, that's going to be a lot of data and a lot of vo and volumes and volumes of data that you will have to process. Uh, even though cloud vendors such as uh, us do a, a phenomenal job with machine learning to kind of identify uh, threats, at some stage, human limits will kick in if you're going to go, uh, go up across uh, looking at all the alerts that are sent. And really the answer to that is, has to be a much more fundamental adoption of machine learning and cloud intelligence and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have today applied tons and tons of that, but I see a world where even if everyone has the larger um, uh, organizations that they have their own security staff, has to actually take steps towards embracing uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually go protect the resources. Um, and and, and um, the other thing that I will say is that we, even today, we are doing a pretty damn good job with machine learning and, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. We're still in the infancy of where we potentially will be five years from now. Uh, I'd leave you with a very simple uh, pardon my, my sports analogy, but I can guarantee you that five years from now, if you look back at what we are doing today and maybe even the next year, it will look like we are in the little leagues compared to professional baseball. And so the opportunity for what we can do going ahead with, the, with cloud uh, harnessing power, analytics and machine learning is tremendous. So to kind of recap, the more sensors you have, the faster will be your detections. The more data you collect and the more data you can process, the better the near, near real-time detections you will have. But you'll also have great forensics and ability to see what is going on. You couple that with cloud effects, you get some tremendous cloud effects and benefits from just having a cloud provider look across millions and millions of tenants to actually find uniqueness of attacks in a very uniform way. And sooner or later, your security organizations, but certainly the cloud providers today are really making big bets on machine learning and artificial intelligence. These things together will fundamentally change the equation and make defense a far more uh, viable and easier option than what we see today. Thank you.